All right, so today we're going to be talking about transcription and translation. And uh, we've talked about the central dogma before. There we go. Uh, we've talked about the central dogma before. That's the idea that DNA can be replicated or that DNA can be transcribed into RNA and RNA is translated into protein. So that flow of information from DNA to RNA to protein, that is the central dogma in a nutshell. Uh, what I'm drawing here that I don't, I haven't drawn, I don't think before on a central dogma uh, drawing is that I have a couple arrows. I have a short arrow and a long arrow for each of those steps. And even for replication, there's a short circle and a, and a bigger circle. And what the point that I'm wanting to drive home here is that everything in a cell is regulated. The cell, we talked about those stop uh, checkpoints during the cell cycle. And uh, we and so we know that the cell time sometimes stops and thinks things through and might not even continue on the way around the cell cycle. Other times there might be lots of nutrients, lots of everything, and the cells just replicate and then they jump around the circle again and go and go and go. So replication can be either fast or slow. Same thing, as you take a, find a gene in the DNA and you start transcribing it, that transcription rate could be slow. It could be from off to slow to super fast, okay? And translation is also, can be turned off, it could be slow or it could be fast. So everything is regulated and uh, so, in this class, we're not going to have time to get into all those regulatory factors, but if you go on to upper level biology, you're going to learn about all the proteins, all the things that play into controlling the rates of each of those. Okay, the next thing, so this slide is showing that transcription, but not translation, can be reversed. Okay, so DNA is nucleic acid. Oh, and these slides are all going to be, you know, posted to OneNote. So if you are scrambling to draw the whole thing out, that's fine if that's what you want to do. But if you just want to wait and write down anything that you think are like take home points, that would work too. So DNA uh, can be transcribed to RNA. And if you reverse that process, go from RNA back to DNA, it's reverse transcription. DNA is nucleic acid. RNA is nucleic acid. What What's protein? Well, proteins are made of amino acids, right? Building blocks. So we went from things that were built with nucleotides to things that are built with amino acids. So transcription, we're going DNA to RNA. That's going from nucleic acid language to nucleic acid and language. And so it's, if you stay in the same language, but just write it down in a slightly different form or whatever, that's transcription. If you go from one language to another, like we do with RNA is nucleic acid language to protein, completely different language, then that's translation. So it's easy, they both start with trans, and so it's easy to switch those two around. Uh, I've been using so I'm pretty good at not doing the, the wrong one at this point, but I, I caught myself yesterday in virology. Okay, another thing that we've talked about in this class was polymerases. We, we said that there were four different categories of polymerases. And if DNA is being replicate, replicated, you, you have a polymerase that reads DNA and then makes DNA. And so right here, we, we have DNA-dependent DNA polymerase is the enzyme that we had used for replicating DNA. If you start with DNA and you want to end up with a molecule of RNA, you want to read the DNA and make some RNA, that's DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Okay. If you want to go from RNA back to DNA, now we just switch the R's and D's around. It's RNA dependent because it reads RNA. DNA polymerase because it makes DNA. Okay. 
RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. That one also has a colloquial name, and it's called reverse transcriptase. Uh, and it was first identified in viruses. Viruses do lots of funky stuff. So when I teach my virology class, we take everything we know about cells, and then we add a bunch on top because viruses get in the cell and, and do things slightly different. So then when the RNA can be copied to make more RNA, viruses do this. A lot of viruses have an RNA genome and they need to make more copies of their genome. It reads RNA and makes RNA, so it's RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP. So we learned about those four types of polymerases last time, but here is taking the central dogma and seeing where they fit in. Okay, the next idea is that modifications create diversity. So we've got our central dogma drawn out again. But one thing I want to point out is that for DNA, you can modify your DNA. Uh, if you've ever heard the term epigenetics, that's when you modify the DNA. Uh, and so you can put methyl groups and other functional groups onto your DNA. And DNA, remember, it's coiled up in the cell. So DNA can be either coiled really tightly and be kind of hidden from being detected or, or being recognized, or DNA can be uncoiled a little bit, a little bit loosened up, and then that makes it so things can go and bind to the DNA a lot easier. So this tight packaging of DNA versus a slightly looser packaging of DNA, that can control the rate at which DNA goes to RNA or whether the DNA is replicated. Okay, the RNA, RNA can be modified. And this is kind of a new area of science. I mean, we've known for a long time that RNA can be modified. But we now have techniques where we can go grab some cells and pull the RNA out and do analysis to figure out what all, what all RNAs have, this sort of modification or that sort of modification. And when I'm saying modifications, a lot of times it's, it's those functional groups that we talked about. You guys remember some of those functional groups? We, this was a month ago. I just mentioned DNA could be methylated. You guys remember what a methyl group looked like? There's a carbon with three hydrogens around it. See so if you tack that onto something. Or we could put a hydroxyl group on things. We could put a phosphate group on things. So there's lots of different things that can modify your RNA. And then finally, protein can be modified as well. So that's called post-translational modification. You went ahead and translated it. You have your protein modifications. Every protein out there has tons of modifications. The interesting thing is that DNA, there's about 20,000 genes in the human genome. We're going to talk about something called alter uh, alternative splicing, a different way of processing the RNA. And that can create 100,000 or more different RNA molecules. And then proteins, those can all be post-translationally modified. So from 20,000 genes through all of these modifications and, and things, we can end up with a couple hundred or a couple million different versions of proteins in the end. So when they, when they originally took the human genome and they decided to sequence all the way across it, they, uh, they expected to find at least 100,000 genes, if not more, in the human genome. And then they were really surprised. Turned out there's only barely over 20,000. And so these modifications are super important to be able to really expand what's going on in a cell. Okay. So some genes encode RNA and not protein as a final product. So when we look at the central dogma, DNA is transcribed 
And we've always just said RNA before, but it's actually mRNA. The M stands for messenger. So it's just a temporary molecule carrying the message that the DNA had. And then the ribosomes translate the mRNA and you make a protein. So when we were saying there's 20,000 genes in the genome, I meant protein coding genes. But there's a lot of places in the genome. What? I'll back up for a second. The genome is 3 billion bases long, base pairs long, but only about 2% of your genome encodes protein. So that's 98% of the genome is something else. So those something else, we're just barely scratching the surface of what your genome has in it. But those something else could be information for RNA molecules. So if DNA goes through mRNA, our product is protein. If DNA gets transcribed and you have a tRNA, tRNA stands for transfer RNA. And I'm not going to expect you guys to memorize all these. Uh, stands for transfer RNA. The transfer RNA is the final product. It does a job in the cell. Okay. Then we have another RNA, and it starts with an MI. The tRNA helps with translation. MI RNA actually can inhibit. It's uh, MI is for micro. If you have ever heard of a micro RNA. Uh, and it can inhibit translation. It can cause mRNAs to be degraded. It's got lots of different uses. The next one on the list, rRNA. This is actually the most abundant kind of RNA in the cell, even though we almost always talk about the mRNA because we're wanting to get on to talking about proteins. rRNA, that lowercase r, stands for ribosome. And the, the enzyme that reads mRNA and makes protein, it is called a ribosome, and it's made, of R, it's made of protein. But the other thing that we haven't mentioned is it's actually made of RNA as well. So RNA and protein work together to make a ribosome. So these rRNAs are super important. I'll just mention this next one, CIRC RNA, CIRC RNA, that's circular RNA, and these were just discovered less than 10 years ago, okay? So there's lots to be discovered in biology. Uh, it's, we're nowhere near knowing everything, and so these different types of RNA, what they are and what they do in the cell, uh, it, leaves plenty of room left to work. And then I wrote many more at the bottom, and I could, I could talk all an entire lecture about the different kinds of RNAs, but we'll just leave it at those. Okay. Now this one, titled, It's Complex. So what am I, uh, what am I wanting to show? Let's just start here looking at protein. And we have protein. You can get a couple different proteins to interact with each other, and you start forming port protein complexes. It could be the same protein. You could have, like, I used to study a protein that had a wonderful name, IRF3. There could be two IRF3 proteins, and they interact, and they form what's called a dimer. So two IRFs interacting together, that's a protein complex. Dimer, di is two, mer is part. We've learned that before. IRF3 could also interact with a different protein called IRF7. And so that's still a dimer, but it's a heterodimer. So we had a homodimer and a heterodimer. Viruses, that's the other class I teach this semester. You can make 180 copies of the Norwalk capsid protein, 
And that is the protein that makes the shell of the virus. You take 180 of those, and they will self-organize into a virus. They don't have a genome in the center, so it's called an empty virus particle. But just 180 copies can go together automatically and form this really complex structure. So it can be two forming a complex. It could be 180. Other viruses are even more complex. So it could be hundreds of proteins working together to form these complexes. So with the rest of these green arrows, what I'm trying to show is that you can, for instance, right here, you can form a lot. You could take a couple different RNA molecules. You can interact and form an RNA complex. DNA can get in the genome could get coated with some RNA. So then you have DNA RNA complexes. And then this arrow is wrong. I meant to draw an arrow from DNA and an arrow from protein. So I put the arrow in the exact wrong spot, but DNA and protein. We're going to talk a little bit later about certain proteins that want to stick to DNA and so on and so forth. So you just mix and match those three molecules and it gets really complex really quickly. And sometimes there's DNA, RNA, and protein. If you guys have heard of the new gene editing, uh, tool called CRISPR. That is where you have one protein, it has an RNA in it, and it binds to DNA. So you can get all three together at once. Okay, So all those things can get mixed and matched and piled together. Okay, And then we're going to get into this a little bit more on Monday, uh, but there's a whole new field where People just started adding omic to the end of words. So if you say genomic, it means everything ha having to do with the genome. Uh, proteomics is everything to do with studying all the proteins that might be made in a cell. Uh, so omics is big data, okay? And you might study the genome. You might study all the different RNAs that are in a cell at a given time. That would be transcriptomics. You could study all the different proteins in a cell at a given time. That's proteomics. You can compare all the different proteins in a cell that didn't get treated with a stimulus versus cells that were maybe infected with a virus. You can compare the proteins between them, and that's also proteomics. So. Omics is, is kind of a catch-all for big data and that we're now getting to the point with our techniques that you can really collect a lot of data really fast and the price has gone down. For example, we, we recently, or we, we sequenced the human genome. They put it together during the 90s and in the early 2000s, they were able to lay out, here's what the human genome looks like. It costs $3 billion. So if you remember, the genome's 3 billion bases long. So it's a dollar per every base pair. Every A, A matched with T, every C matched with G through the whole, 3 billion long. Now we can sequence a genome for less than $100. For a long time, $1,000 was the goal, and, and we've gotten to less than $100. So uh, genomics, the price goes down very fast. It's getting to where handling all the data is actually the hard part. Okay. Interactomes. So I just mentioned before all those different RNA DNA complexes or protein DNA complexes or protein protein complex complexes. That fits under the guise of uh, interactome. So all these different molecules interacting with each other. And then we, we spent several days talking about metabolism. We spent a couple days on cellular respiration and then another day on uh, photosynthesis. And the metabolome is when we look at all those, when glucose goes into a six carbon molecule and then it gets broken down into two, three carbon molecules that have a phosphate on each and then it 
then the phosphates go away. Remember all the carbon counting we did? Well, each one of those, after each of the steps in a metabolic pathway, you end up with a different metabolite. So you can do metabolomics to study all the different molecules in a cell that aren't necessarily the macromolecules we've been talking about. So that's metabolomics. Any questions? I'm kind of going through this. Okay. Okay. So we're supposed to talk about transcription and translation today. So I just kind of uh, talked about the, the central dogma for a long time, but let's go ahead and take a, a closer look at what might be happening in those steps. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to talk about transcription and translation in E. coli. And then I'm going to back up and we're going to switch over to talking about in human cells. We're going to talk about transcription and translation in human cells. So everything I say until you see the word human is all bacterial transcription and translation. Okay, so transcription, we need a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, right? So let's bring a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase into, uh, onto the genome. So that black line that I have drawn, drawn across there is the genome. Where it says start, that is where you're going to start making an mRNA version of whatever the DNA said at that plus one site. And so if you, if you went, if the, if the, trans, uh, the polymerase goes from the plus one and it moves in a five prime to three prime direction, then it's going to go to plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five. And then stop might be at position plus 1400 or something like that. If you go to the left of the start site, you use negative numbers. There is no zero. So then one, the nucleotide sitting right next to plus one is minus one, minus two, minus three. There's going to be some sequence at minus 10 and some more sequence at minus 35 that that polymerase can recognize. Okay. So those are just different DNA sequence motifs that the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase recognizes. And so the, the polymerase gets recruited right onto the DNA. It can see the DNA, it can tell what the sequence is, and it sticks there. And then it's going to want to go five prime to three prime direction. It's going to want to go from left to right in the drawing we have here. So then it's going to start there, um, and then it'll, it'll start at the start and start making an RNA, and when it gets to the stop, it'll let go of the genome, and the RNA goes floating off, the polymerase goes floating off. Polymerase could come back and, and make that gene again, so it could be a repetitive cycle. Each time it wakes its way through, another RNA is made. Okay. So step one, polymerase recruited the sequence of the promoter. The next thing to know is that if the polymerase is always able to see that sequence, the minus 10 sequence and the minus 35 sequence, we, we might want to be able to stop transcription. These boxes along here each represent a different gene. What if the cell isn't in need of making those genes? So we want to be able to block transcription. So there's a blue protein that I drew in called a repressor, and it can sit down and it's basically like a roadblock. So if the repressor is bound to the DNA, the transcript is not going to be made. But if the, D if the repressor lets go of the DNA, then it, it's going to be able to transcribe. A lot of times, if, if, we, if you go on to take polls, we'll give a couple of examples of this. And usually, there's some molecule that the repressor can bind. Sometimes, if the repressor binds to a molecule, that will make it want to stick to the DNA. Other times, it's when the, when the, when the repressor sticks to the molecule, it'll let go of the DNA. 
We've got two different versions there. But it's regulated on usually a metabolite of some sort. So do we want to make more of this metabolite? We should get the repressor out of there, make the trans, make those genes so the cell can make it. Okay, so repressors can block. The other type that you can have is an enhancer. Okay. So transcription activator or enhancer. In bacteria, it's called an enhancer. In human cells, you usually call it a transcription activator. And you'll note that it binds uh, more to the left of where the polymerase wants to bind so that it's not sitting there as a roadblock. So it, it sits there and it recruits the polymerase in faster. It says, come on in and, and we need to make more and more of this. So there are some systems that have both a repressor and an enhancer. And if the repressor is gone, but the enhancer is not there, you might get a, a slow transcription rate. If the repressor is gone and the enhancer is there, then you can get fast. So you could be off, low, or high instead of just on or off. So you can start to see that the, the rate can, can vary depending on what's happening around that transcription start site. Okay, and these regulators, the repressors and the enhancers, are called transcription factors. Okay, it used to be in biology if they knew some molecule was involved in something but they didn't know what it was, they just called it a factor until they figured out what it was. So factor comes up fairly often in in biology and it just means they at the time they didn't know if it was a protein or a, a different molecule a sugar molecule or whatever it was just some factor okay so we just talked about transcription initiation the next step is elongation and the step after that is termination so the what I'm showing here is that the DNA dependent RNA polymerase will start working in a five prime to three prime direction and it starts to make the RNA at uh, right even with the start site and it stops making the RNA right even with the stop site. So this genome, the black line is the genome, it actually extends in both directions for millions of base pairs. It's a circular DNA, right? It's in a circle. So we've just zoomed in on one part of that entire genome. The RNA is going to be exactly the length from the transcription start site to the transcription stop site. The other thing that I wrote on this slide is that this RNA encodes for four genes. In humans, we're going to see that you usually only make one gene, or you only have one gene on any given mRNA. So you can only make one protein from any given RNA. In bacteria, what they do is, is that, let me see. Yeah, I'm going to hold off on that thought. So we've got the RNA, and we've got, um, now I've got start and stop written again and again and again. I just want to back up this start and this stop on this slide are for transcription. The start and stop, start and stop on this slide, we're now moved over to talking about translation. So we had said that Transcription is initiation, elongation, and termination. And we had said that uh, translation, the three steps are initiation, elongation, and termination. So we're on to the initiation, elongation, and termination here. The ribosomes, I've drawn them as just a black circle here. I'll have a slightly more detail in a future picture, but I have it written as a black circle. So those ribosomes in a bacteria mRNA are recruited right close to the start codon. The specific sequence that those ribosomes see has a name called Schindelgarno sequence. So it's some 
whatever sequence is right upstream of the start codon for this gene is going to also be seen right before the start codon of that one and that one and that one. So since they all have the same sequence, now the ribosome only needs to know how to get to one type of a, a M, an RNA sequence and it can go to town. So it gets down on the start, it reads through the protein in a five prime to three prime direct, or reads through the RNA in a five prime to three prime direction. And then you have the stop codon is where translation terminates. Okay, so uh, initiation, elongation, and termination are shown all in the same picture. So initiation right at the start codon, elongation as it works its way towards the stop codon, and then when it lets go, that's termination. It does that in each of those four genes. So all of these four genes, why is that side slant changes, but that side doesn't. Okay, I guess stop looking at that side. <laughs> okay, so over here on this on this screen, operons encode proteins for uh, encode proteins that do teamwork. So what I mean by that is all four of these genes were controlled by that one promoter some enhancers or some repressors that controlled it and if the trans if the RNA dependent RNA or DNA dependent RNA polymerase went ahead and transcribed an RNA you ended up with four pro protein coding sequences on that RNA so we translate each of those and we get protein 1 protein 2 protein 3 protein 4 then they those four proteins more often than not are, con are going to work together for some sort of cellular process. For example, lactose is a type of sugar, and lactose is not the preferred sugar for if you want to do glycolysis, because lactose is a dimer. If bacteria have a shortage of glucose, that's what you want for cellular respiration, right? And they... Uh, the shortage of glucose to, to break down, but there's lactose around, then these proteins or these genes would get upregulated. And one of these might be for importing the lactose into the cell. And another one might be for breaking the lactose that's a dimer into galactose and glucose. And then all of a sudden you've got some glucose to work with, right? Okay, so, so that is, that the key term there is operons. So the, the genes, here I've drawn four, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's eight. The number of, of proteins in a given stretch that are controlled by one promoter, it, the number can change, but usually they work together somehow. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. Okay, so that was the end of our bacteria transcription and translation. So let's switch over to what happens in a human cell. So this, at first glance, it kind of looks like that operon that I drew on the genome of the bacteria, where we have a number of rectangles going left to right. We've got a transcription start site, we've got a transcription stop site, Again, I use black for the genome. And these boxes here, I've labeled them one, two, three, four, five. And last time, each box represented a different protein coding sequence. This time, all five of those boxes together represent one protein coding sequence. So 
because they're spread out all over the place, some processing has to happen. Okay, so then I'm going to bring in a couple new terms here, exons and introns. All the boxes with the number in them are exons. All the sequence between the exons are introns. exons are going to have the important information that we want to keep. The introns are going to have sequence that we want to get out of there. Okay, So we, we need to somehow get rid of all of those introns and stick the exons together. So that's processing. Okay, So if you have a DNA dependent RNA polymerase come in and transcribe, reads the genome and transcribes an RNA. In humans, it starts out as something called a pre mRNA. So it, you can see I started drawing it at the same, at, at, even with the start, uh, transcription start site, and I stopped drawing it even with the transcription stop site. And then I have all those boxes that we saw in the genome, I also have them here. I just want to point out, the genome's double-stranded DNA, and just because there's a box doesn't mean it's not double-stranded DNA anymore. And just because it's a single line doesn't mean it's not double-stranded DNA. I'm just highlighting interesting sequences with the boxes, okay? Same thing here. Pre-mRNA is a single-stranded RNA. And so I'm just highlighting within that single-stranded RNA where some interesting features are. So after transcription of that pre-mRNA, this is when the processing really begins. There's three steps to processing, or three different parts to processing. One is cap, adding a cap to your RNA. So way down here on the 5' prime end of the RNA, I've got a circle drawn. And that circle represents a molecule attached to the 5' prime end. And rather than draw out that molecule, I just draw it as a circle, and then that's called the cap. It's a 7-methylguanosine, if you want to know. Over here, on the far 3' prime end, we have polyadenylated was one of the things that has to happen during processing. And what that means is that we just, at the end of the RNA, we just put a bunch of A's on. And the RNAs can be A's, C's, G's, or U's, but there's a signal towards the end of this RNA here that says uh, add a bunch of A's. And it might have been added at this point too. This drawing might not be 100% accurate. But a processed RNA has a cap at the 5' prime end and a poly A tail at the 3' prime end. Those are important for translation, but we're not going to get into that. The other thing we have is that on the pre-mRNA, we had all the introns still there. The sequences between the boxes, the boxes are exons, right? During processing, we splice out we splice together, exon 1 gets spliced to exon 2, exon 2 gets spliced to exon 3, and you lose all of that intervening sequence. Okay. So we still have exons 1 through 5, just like we have here. We just lost all those introns. See some writing, so... Pause for a second. If you're on to the mature RNA, we're going to have it again on this slide. Okay. So the way that we drew the mature RNA on the top, the focus there was which parts of that RNA were made of the exons. I drew this here 
but now my box has changed. The axons are usually drawn as boxes that are kind of even with the line. And then here, I've got the box above the line. This is just kind of biology shorthand. And that's how I had uh, drawn the mRNA back when we were talking about bacteria. So what that means is that this box right here represents where the protein coding sequence is. So it's the part that's going to get translated right through here. This is not translated. This is not translated. Just the box. So I know all those boxes can be confusing. Just, just know that sometimes you're talking about exons and sometimes you're talking about the protein coding sequence. Okay, so now that we've got an RNA with the protein coding sequences, let's remember that translation has three steps. Initiation, elongation, and termination. So what I have drawn here, the thing that I added, the first thing that I added that I want to put, draw your attention to, are the red circles. The red circles are your ribosome. There's two circles because one is the large subunit of the ribosome and the other one's the small subunit of the ribosome. Okay. They are separate uh, when they're not doing translation. There is a ton of steps that I'm skipping over that has to happen right at that cap. But that brings the small subunit in, and then pretty soon the large subunit gets brought in. And you have, with both the large and small subunit, on your beginning of your open reading frame, that's the start site, translation start site. The ribosome will then work the caps at the 5' end, the polyatails at the 3' end. So the ribosome also works 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So this first ribosome was where it just started. Then I have another arrow that says elongation. That's a ribosome that had gotten there earlier and had been able to work its way along the mRNA. So sometimes you can have multiple ribosomes reading along an mRNA. And that has a word called polysome. But anyway, as it moves 5' prime to 3', prime, it's going to read three nucleotides at a time. Those are called codons. So it's a little bit like Morse code, uh, but in ACs, Gs, and Us. It reads three ACs, Gs, and Us, then it reads the next three, then the next three, then the next three. And each time that it jumps along three nucleotides at a time, you get one more amino acid added. So those green dots, I have a, a series of green dots coming out of that ribosome, and uh, the black line just indicates that they're covalently stuck together. You get the elongation is, is not that the mRNA changes, but that your amino acids keep getting added until you've got a long chain of amino acids. Okay. And then finally, step three is termination. The end of the box here represents the translation stop. And at the stop codon, the small and large subunits fall apart. Okay. So that's the last thing that happens with translation is those ribosomes falling apart. That was a ton of material. Uh, I, I did it this way so that we could record it better for posting for anyone that's not here. Do you guys like this method better or when I write it out? When I write it out, I know that I don't go so fast that I'm like getting ahead of you. I saw a lot of scribbling, which could be frustrating. Anyone want to... You, you like it better when I'm writing? Okay.